So if you came in after Chris did the welcome, uh, and you kind of sounds like that the video sound is coming from the back and wondering why I'm not wearing my mic and wondering why we got a very unplugged feel this morning, it's because this morning our entire sound system crashed. I walked in for uh, rehearsal and I was coming in, they'd been rehearsing, but I, I noticed I hadn't heard the music, but I thought, eh, I'm just sure they're just a little quieter this morning. I walk in and it's really quiet in here too. And I see people running and I'm like, oh, that cannot be good. And uh, so it turns out we had no sound. So as I understand what happened is the, the jiggy bopper over here did not communicate with the whatchamacallit in the back. And so it wasn't working. So they moved the whatchamacallit in the back up here. So we've got a little sound uh, that we didn't have before, but it's why it's so acoustic. And when we didn't know if we were gonna have any sound, I, I sat right in my chair right there and I just started praying, God, guys, give us our sound system. Give us power back to the sound system. And suddenly I was convicted. I'm preaching a sermon on grace today. And grace is enough. And God said that to me right there, like, you need my power. You, you don't need power. And I just want to start differently. Satan tried to mess us up this morning, and he almost got to me. But there are places in the world where they don't have stages or lights or sound systems. They're meeting in little caves or houses hiding, worried about people coming in and arresting them or, or hurting them for being Christians. And the gospel is spreading like wildfire in those places. So, I want us to feel God's power today. I'm starting a little different than I was going to because we don't need this. We need God. So, anyway, let's get started. But just keep in mind, that's the, that's, I like that sound. That's a good sound system. Well, we're in the middle of our sermon series, uh, Games We Play, where we're looking at some different popular games and we're talking about how those games can be a picture or an illustration of the Christian life and how we can actually grow in some areas of following Jesus. And today's game is Jenga or Jenga, I don't know how you pronounce it, but it's one of the two. And how many of you guys have played Jenga? Yeah, almost everybody. It's a pretty simple game. You build these blocks, you build a little tower of blocks by turning these little blocks different directions. And then once it's completely built, then you start pulling the blocks out one by one. And at first it's pretty easy because the foundation is pretty secure. But as you keep pulling blocks off, it gets more uh, wobbly and eventually it's gonna come crashing down. And when it does, it's gonna surprise us usually and it makes a lot of noise. And the reality is a lot of people think about religion like building up a Jenga block. They think about we try to do good stuff and we get to add a block, when we do bad stuff, a block comes off, and, and a lot of Christians think about it this way, that somehow we can earn God's favor, we can earn God's forgiveness and love, and we do that by trying to do more good stuff than bad. And, and so here's how that works. So if you go to the grocery store and you help an elderly person with their groceries, you get to put on a block of righteousness. You've done something good that goes to the list. And, and then maybe if it's cold, and you give some milk to the neighborhood stray cat and you make a little warm place for it to sleep, you get to add another block. But then you lie at work because you were trying to keep from getting in trouble for a mistake that was made and a block comes back off. And, and then you're having problems and you treat your spouse really poorly and another block comes back off. And we kind of think about religion. We kind of even think about Christianity as working this way. You guys know who Muhammad Ali is, or was? Yeah, Muhammad Ali was a great boxer. He was a heavyweight champion, but he was also pretty cool because he had really cool ways of saying things. And he was interviewed back in 2001 by Reader's Digest about what religion looks like. And in his typical Muhammad Ali fashion, he had a very poetic way of saying what he thought. He says, rivers, pools, lakes, and streams they all have different names, but all contain water. Religions have different names, but all contain truth. One day we're all going to die and God's going to judge us, our good deeds and bad. If the bad outweighs the good, we go to hell. If the good outweighs the bad, you go to heaven. See, Muhammad Ali was fun to listen to because he had that neat way of saying things. 
but he had a real messed up idea of how our relationship with God works. And I think so many of you have that same idea that it's just good versus bad and we're just constantly trying to stack more good stuff up and as soon as we do it, more stuff comes off because we mess up and we're in this constant battle of trying to earn God's approval. And it can wear you out. It can make you lose your faith in religion. It can cause you to lose confidence in the church. It can just make you tired and want to just go a different direction. And, and if I'm honest, churches have not always done the best job of clearing up this confusion about what it means to earn God's approval. And, and so you may have been in a church growing up where it was all about that. It was all about the good stuff and the bad, and you never quite measured it up. It was like every Sunday, the preacher was staring right at you, and he would say, you blew it again this week, but hey, thanks for playing. Maybe, maybe you'll do better next week. But you never were, you never measured up, and so you began to lose your faith in the church, and you began to just, just grow tired of religion. But let me be very clear about what following Jesus looks like. Following Jesus is not like building the Jenga blocks up. It has nothing to do with that. Jenga can pre present a pretty good illustration or a picture of what our righteousness looks like, but it's not preparing the tower. Check out this video. Christianity looks more like the end of a Jenga game because the reality is every single one of us have failed. No matter what we do, how much we look like we've got it together, we have all failed. We cannot earn God's favor. We cannot earn God's approval. And no matter how many blocks we stack up, it's never enough. And so today I want to talk about what grace looks like. And what following Jesus looks like. And I want to start with the bad news. The bad news is that you failed. That I failed. Listen to how the Apostle Paul says this in Romans 3, 10 through 18. He says, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have become together worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways, and the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. So if you think I was tough on you when I said you failed, I can't stick with Paul. This is some very bad news from Paul. And Christianity starts with really bad news. Following Jesus is all about how we haven't measured up, how we have failed. But let's be honest, we, we kind of all fail in different ways. And some of us look like we've got it more together than other, others. But make no mistake, every single one of us have failed. Now, I want to talk about three different categories of failure. And you're going to fit into one of those categories. I promise you, you fit in one of them. And so as we go through this message... I want to challenge you to really think about what category do I go in? And, and so as we go, you go, oh yeah, that's me. Just, just, you don't have to raise your hand or anything, but just recognize where you fit. Let's start with the first one. The first one is the spectacular fail. This is a fail. You know you failed. Everybody around you knows you failed. It's like the true end of a Jenga game. It comes crashing down and smacks you on the top of your head. You remember that old TV show, Called, on ABC, called ABC's Wide World of Sports. Do y'all remember that? Yeah, it had this amazing intro, right, with the, the guy that says, bringing you the constant variety of sports, the thrill of victory, and the agony of defeat. And it said agony of defeat, this ski jumper came down this huge ski jump ramp, and he went off the side and fell to what I can only assume was a really bad day. That's a spectacular fail. 
He knew he felt. We all knew he felt. The entire world saw it on TV. And, and some of you recognize a spectacular fail because of your living. Maybe your marriage is in shambles and you're headed towards divorce and you can't hide it anymore. Your friends and family all know what's going on. They, they know the failure in your marriage. Or, or maybe it's an addiction that has gotten so out of control that everybody around you knows the struggle you're having. Maybe it's problems with the law and everybody around you knows exactly what's going on. Maybe your spectacular fail is your anxiety and depression have gotten out of hand and they've gotten so bad that you some days can't even get up and go to work or get up and do things and, and you cry all the time and everybody around you knows the struggle that you're going through. So is that the category that you fit into? There, there's another type of fail that's a little more subtle, but it's also a little more dangerous. It is called the hidden fail. It's where you know you failed, but you've hidden it from everybody else. So maybe your marriage isn't on the brink of divorce, but it's not good either. It's to a place where it seems like you fight all the time. And when you fight, the, the bitterness and the anger and the resentment lasts for days or weeks, maybe even months. The love and the intimacy that was there at one point in time is gone. And people around you don't know, your friends don't know, your family doesn't know that you're failing, but, but you know, you, you see that failure. And, and maybe it's an addiction to alcohol or drugs. Your friends, they just all think you're a great person to party with and hang out with. But deep down, you know it's different. Maybe you even sometimes convince yourself that you've got it under control. But let me ask you a question. Could you go 30 days without taking a drink? And if you're sitting there wondering whether you could do that or not, you may have a problem. And that's a hidden fail because you know you have a problem and other people don't. Maybe it's an addiction to pornography and you go to those websites, you go to those places on your phone whenever you get bored or you get a little depressed. Nobody else knows. They don't know what your search history is, but you do. They, they don't know how you view the women around you because of what images you're seeing. They don't know how it's affected your marriage, but you do. You've hidden it, but you know. Some of you, maybe your one secret is you're cheating at work or you're lying. You really struggle with greed or anger or bitterness. Now, maybe your secret fail is the comparison trap that we talked a lot about last week. And you have this real tendency to look around at other people and look at the people that you think you're doing better than. And to get all puffed up and filled with pride when you see your job's better than theirs. You make more money than they do. Your kids are better than they are. And about the time you get all excited about yourself, then you get on social media and you see somebody that's got more than you do. They have a better job than you do. Their kids just made head cheerleader and you only uh, have a cheerleader in the family. And, and you notice that when they post something, they get more of those little like emojis and the little you know, praying hands and, and the little hearts and all that than you do. So clearly, they have more close friends than you do based on their Facebook response. And so you begin to be filled with jealousy and you struggle to find contentment in your life. Maybe your hidden fail is money, and, and you've got debt that's just spiraling out of control. You're working so hard to keep up with the neighbors down the street that you're going into debt. Everybody else thinks you just got enough stuff. You've got a great car, good looking house. You go on all the right vacations, but you know that's all an illusion. I read the other day that the average American family lives on 107% of its annual income. I'm not an accountant <laughs> or a mathematician, but that math doesn't add up. We're so worried about our appearance that it's become more important than reality. For some of you, it is bitterness. And something was done to you a long time ago, maybe it was a big deal, maybe it was just a series of little things, but now you can't let it go. You can keep playing that hurt over and over in your mind, and you just can't get past it. Bitterness comes in a lot of different flavors, but it's always ugly, and it's always sin. I've heard someone say that bitterness is like drinking poison, hoping it'll hurt the other person. 
And if you think about it, you know it's true. I'm about to say something you don't want to hear, but you already know. If you're bitter, your bitterness is hurting you way worse than it's hurting the person you're bitter against. And maybe that's your secret hidden fail. So, is this your category? Is this the one you're in? And the last category is the most dangerous of all. It's the secret fail. It is when you're failing and you don't even know it. You feel like, you know, I'm knocking life out of the park. And my job is good, my marriage is great, my kids are going to all the right school, everything is working, um, but deep down, you still feel like something's missing. And here's the dangerous thing about this secret fail. It's like you're a person with terminal cancer that doesn't even know it yet. Deep down, they've got this cancer that's growing, and they're not aware that it's even happening. They, they may not feel great every day, but they think that's just how life is supposed to be. That's the way it goes. It, it's killing them, and they don't even know it. That's why this secret fail is so dangerous, because you're failing and you don't even know it. I, I think some of you may not see your own failure because things are going really well for you. And you really, why do I need Jesus to change that? Why do I need him to mess things up? Is your thought process. And so you feel pretty good about yourself. Some of you may struggle with secret fail because you think about religion and following Jesus like a Jenga block. And then you do something I call comparative uh, morality or comparative righteousness. And you look at the Jenga box blocks you're building, and your Jenga tower looks way better than everybody else's around you. So you must be doing all right. You, you think about the person at work, and you think, well, I'm be better than them. He's cheating on his wife. Your neighbor is cheating on his taxes, and he's probably the one that's letting his dog go to the bathroom in your yard. You're not sure, but you think it is. And your friend from church, you know where they go every Saturday night. You know what they do. And so you feel like me and I am stacking up the blocks better than other people. And, and so what happens is you become convinced that you are good enough. But compared in righteousness is a lie. It's a lie from Satan, and the danger of that lie is that before you realize you're even failing, it's too late to do anything about it. The Bible tells us that no matter what we've done, how many blocks we've stacked up, no matter how much righteous stuff we've done, we fail. It's, it's not good enough. Listen how Paul says this in Romans 3.23. He says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That word all there, the, the Greek word, that for all literally translates to all, which is why they did it. And what that means is all of us. That's me, that's you. However much someone else looks like they've got it together, however much you think you've got it together, we all fail. See, Satan tries to lull us to sleep by telling us it's like this Jenga block and we're stacking up enough good stuff. Maybe some of you guys are pretty easy on yourself. You don't have to stack up very, very many blocks. You just go to church every once in a while and you just try to be a pretty good person and that's good enough. But Satan's blowing you to sleep about what it means to follow Jesus. See, what's so dangerous about this secret fail is that you're dead on the inside and you don't even know it. Whether you fail spectacularly and everybody around you knows whether you're maybe doing a pretty good job of hiding your fail, but you know it, or maybe you're feeling like life is pretty good and you've got the secret fail. Whatever it is, we fail. That's the bad news. Now, here's a little good news. We're all in this together. When the Bible says we all have failed, it means that we are all in this together. We're all in the same place. None of us has it together, no matter how much we act like we do. And so church has to be a place where we can allow ourselves to be aware of our brokenness and even to, to share that with one another. Because we understand no matter what it looks like across the aisle, they're broken too, and we're all in this together. See, I, I think in the South, particularly in church, we come with this everything's awesome attitude. So we show up at church, we're like, I'm great, marriage is great, kids are great, life is great, and we smile and we go home to a broken, messed up world. We cannot do that. We act like at church that everything looks like it does on social media. Have you ever noticed on social media people don't really share their failures? They, every time you see a picture on social media, it's their kids winning something. It's them vacationing at the right spot, you know, drinking uh, pina colada, uh, the, the virgin kind of course, with all their friends, 
hanging out. Their life is awesome. No one posts a picture of the divorce papers that got served on them. No, nobody posts a picture of the bottle of pills or the bottle of tequila that's emotionally empty that kind of takes them away from their pain and their failure for a little while. Nobody posts a video of their kids yelling, I hate you and I want to die. Those things don't make it to social media. We put on this mask of happiness and success. We don't let others know what's really going on. That's okay on social media, but it cannot be the way this church works. We have to come in broken for Jesus to fix us. We have to be a place where it's okay to recognize that we're all works in progress. Because whether we admit it or not, we are. And if we can acknowledge that, if we can recognize that and understand what Jesus does, Jesus takes things that are dead and broken and ugly, and he brings them back to life, and he makes them beautiful, and he makes them better and new. But if we come in and act like we've got it all together, and we leave today still acting that way, we're never going to experience the true grace of Jesus. The word grace is an incredibly important word for Christians. It's so important that our church name is Karis City. If you didn't know this, Karis is the Greek or the New Testament word for grace. Grace is a huge deal. We talk about it all the time. But do we really understand what it means? And more important, do we really appreciate how grace applies to us? So the, the simple definition that I use of grace is the undeserved, unmerited favor and love. And so when we apply this to our relationship with God, it means that we don't deserve God's love. We don't deserve God's forgiveness. And yet, he gives it to us anyway. Here's, here's why we need grace so desperately. We worship a holy and righteous God. God is so holy and righteous that he can't even stand to be in the very presence of sin. And we've talked about it. We're a broken and messed up people. And so we got a problem. We can't be in the same relationship with God except for grace. Except for what Jesus did for us on the cross. See, when we understand that, we can appreciate why what happened on the cross 2,000 years ago still matters today. Here is the takeaway truth from this message. We failed it, but Jesus nailed it. If I were going to try to sum up the gospel in as few words as possible, that's it right there. We failed it, but Jesus nailed it. That is the truth of the gospel. Jesus died so that despite our failure, we can still be forgiven and set free. Romans 6.23 says it this way. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. The punishment for our sin, for our failure, is death. But Jesus nailed our sin to the cross. Jesus nailed it so that we could be forgiven, so that we could be set free. He took our failure and he nailed that to the cross. This is what the Apostle Paul says in Romans 5, 6-8. He said, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Here is the amazing thing that was done for us on the cross. And if you're a Christian and you've been around church for a while, I think there's going to be a tendency for you to kind of tune me out for the next 30 or 45 seconds and go, yeah, I've heard this all before. And you have. But it ought to have such deep meaning to us. Jesus is God. He lived in the perfection of heaven where he was served by 10,000 angels. And he left the perfection of heaven where he was a king and God. And he came to earth where he was treated like a servant, where he lived life as a man. But he didn't just live life as a man. He, he lived as a perfect man. He never made one failure, not one mistake, not one sin. So he was perfect and without blemish. And then he went to the cross to suffer and die for our sin. Not his. He never messed up. He died for our sin. 
And, and the amazing thing is that while he was there on the cross, in terrible physical pain and agony, something else amazing happened. Jesus took all of the wrath of God, that righteous anger, that punishment for our sin, and he took it all on himself and paid the price of it. Look at the next verse, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. It says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We knocked the Jenga board down. We failed spectacularly, whether we realize it or not. And what this verse is saying, what the gospel tells us is despite our failure, Jesus nailed that failure to the cross so that we can be righteous and pure. I mess up all the time. I don't have to look back weeks or months or years. I, I can just look at the last couple of days. I, I fail Jesus in some way almost every day. I, I get filled with pride. I, I don't serve him the way I should. I get a bad attitude. I failed this morning when I showed up and the sound system wasn't working. I, I became so worried that without a good sound system, we were not gonna have a good church meeting forgetting that grace is all we need. Grace changes the world. That's what Jesus did for us on the cross. Despite my sin, despite my failure, Jesus sees me as holy and pure and righteousness because he sees me through the lens of Jesus' blood on the cross. That changes everything. Our punishment was taken by Jesus. That's what it looks like. So I, I want to talk for just a minute about how do we respond to this grace? How do we respond to this incredible gift that we've been given? I, I said we're all in this together. It doesn't matter what we've done, how we've messed up, but how we respond is different for different people. Depends on where you are. For those of you that aren't following Jesus, that you haven't made that commitment. Maybe you've been around church a while and you're just trying to figure out if you believe anything that I'm saying up to this point. You have to accept the grace of Jesus. That grace is there for you. That love is there for you. Like, I, I don't know how you failed. Maybe you failed spectacularly. Maybe you failed in a way that you know but nobody else knows. Maybe you're even failing in a way that you don't even appreciate. But suddenly you recognize there's something missing. There's something that needs to change in your life. See, Jesus nailed your sin and your failure to the cross. But that's not enough to receive that grace. Here's the problem you've got. God is holy and righteous. And I'm about to say something you may not want to hear, but it's true. God is angry about your sin. And if you're not a follower of Jesus, he's angry at you. Jesus paid the price of that. But you've got to accept him. You've got to accept that grace. I've heard it said that if a thousand steps separate us from God, Jesus has taken the first 999, but the last one is up to you. Here's how you do that. Look at John 3.16 through 18. A lot of you guys know John 3.16. It's, it's on uh, posters everywhere, but maybe not so much 17 and 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his own one and only son, and whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and holy son. We are saved by grace through faith. When we believe in Jesus, we believe that he is who he says he was, that he is God in the flesh, that he came and lived a perfect life on earth, that he died for our sins, and three days later he rose, defeating death, not just for himself, but for us as well. When we believe that, that's the start of what it looks like to follow Jesus. And then, because of that belief, we understand that we are a messed up Jenga board, that we have sin that we cannot fix ourselves. And so we let him fix it for us, and then we live a life as best we can that tries to bring him honor and glory. We'll continue to mess up, but we do what we can to follow Jesus. And then we're baptized 
as kind of this outward symbol of the decision that we've made. And, you know, baptism by immersion is such a beautiful picture of what's happening on the inside. Because when we're buried in the water, it's just like Jesus was buried in the tomb. And then when we come out of the water, just like when Jesus rose from the dead and walked out of the tomb, when we come out of that water, we're alive again as well. That sin within us is gone and we're a new creation. We're holy and pure. Listen to how Isaiah 118 says it. This is the New King James translation. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. That's what happens when we accept grace. All our being angry. God takes in the blood of Jesus. Then, then for those of us who are already Christians, we've been changed by grace. That's not the end. We should be changed by grace every time we think about how amazing it is. When we recognize the brokenness of all our good stuff and how we don't measure up. We fail, and yet we're forgiven. Listen to how the message paraphrase, paraphrases Isaiah, Isaiah 53, 4 through 6. This is an Old Testament prophecy about Jesus that was written about 700 years before he was even born. Here's what it says. But the fact is, it was our pain he carried, our disfigurements, all the things wrong with us. We thought he'd brought it on himself, that God was punishing him for his own failures. But it was our sin that did that to him, that ripped and tore and crushed him. Our sins. He took the punishment and that made us whole. Through his bruises, we get healed. We're all like sheep, wandered off and gotten lost. We've all done our own thing, gone our own way. And God has piled all of our sins, everything we've done wrong on him, on him. That's what Isaiah said 700 years before Jesus was born. See, I put Jesus on the cross as surely as the Roman soldier that nailed those nails into his hands. I sin did that. Your sin did that. We are responsible for Jesus being on the cross. But then he went willingly. He took our sin and he nailed it to the cross with him. And that is grace. And so as Christians, we acknowledge our brokenness. We recognize our failure. And when we do that, we get to experience the power of grace all over again. But we've still got failure. And how do we respond? We try to live our lives in a way that honors the sacrifice that Jesus made. Because the reality is we've still got failure that we need to work on. And we do that to honor the sacrifice of Jesus' and death. So I want you to close your eyes for just a minute, bow your heads. And I want you to ask yourself this question. Where do I still fail? And in what areas of my life am I not fully following Jesus? Maybe you need to fix your marriage. We've got a marriage series starting in a couple of weeks, and you need to commit to be here every week of that. Maybe you have a dating life that's not honoring God. Maybe it's greed or lust or bitterness or jealousy. Maybe it's just the way you act around your friends, the jokes you tell, the way you talk, the places that you go. Maybe it's just you're not being generous with God with your time or your resources. You're not trusting God with all that you have. Look, I don't know where you fail, but you do. To experience the fullness of God's grace all over again, we got to give those failures to God. Jesus died as a sacrifice so that you could have life. Now the challenge is to live your life as a sacrifice for his. The challenge is to live in the fullness of grace. You can open your eyes, raise your hands. Grace saves us. Grace is enough for us. Grace changes us. It transforms us. It challenges us. It comforts us. Grace is enough. Here's the beauty of grace. Grace means you don't have to prove you're worthy of God's love. It means you don't have to keep a scorecard or a Jenga board of all the things you've done wrong and all the things you've done right and try to make sure it measures up. 
It means you can forgive yourself for what you've done because that sin has already been paid for on the cross. It means that your sin can be forgiven. The chains can be torn down no matter how long or heavy those chains may be. It means that when you follow Jesus, you are no longer your failure. You're no longer your past mistakes, your hang-ups, your insecurities. You're a new creation. The Bible says that you're a son or daughter of the God of the universe. That's what we become. Grace changes us. Grace changes everything. The simple beauty of grace is this. We've all failed, but we're still forgiven. Jesus nailed our failure to the cross. Let's pray.